questions. Welcome to HSC Biology and Module 8, Non-Infectious Disease and Disorders. This is video number 16. We're going to be looking at some of the benefits of epidemiological studies. Now really what you need to do is to put a lot of the stuff that we've been talking about around epidemiology together because it's very difficult to do your evaluations uh, in isolation. So what we'll do is provide you with some examples of epidemiological studies and get you to start to analyze those, look at the types of studies they are, and also look at some of the benefits that are associated with these sorts of studies. So we want you to make sure that you can describe and preferably explain two benefits of epidemiological studies, and maybe some of the criteria associated with that, and then once you're given studies to be able to evaluate those studies and discuss um, some of the benefits and implications. So what is it about the scope of epidemiology that makes these sorts of studies so very important? Well, firstly, they are interdisciplinary, and that is a really important thing because there's a lot of different aspects that come together, not just um, aspects of health. There's aspects of government policy. There's aspects of education aspects of economy and each of these has something to say or maybe something to gain from the outcome of certain types of epidemiological studies and as a result of this they tend to be very comprehensive in their scope and not just in their scope and in terms of the 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 how many uh, subjects are usually the study, uh, the subject of each of these studies, but also the potential implications. And as I talked about previously, those implications can have economic consequences, educational consequences, and certainly health consequences, and maybe even lifestyle consequences. So they impact on a large number of areas of society. Good epidemiological studies can provide early warning systems, so we can actually get a sense of what might be happening if a, a new pathogen is introduced into a population, if we find a factor is actually starting to have an impact on health rates, diseases, cancer rates, those sorts of things. We can use some of these studies to start to get a little bit of an early idea about what's going on. They can inform strategic approaches to both prevention and management. So in any situation that we're looking at, we're trying first to prevent it, okay? We're trying first to stop a population from being exposed to a particular disease. But then if we can't do that, then we have to manage it. Then we have to look at ways of trying to contain the spread or um, minimize the number of people who are exposed uh, to look at some of the risk factors associated with that and they can have massive consequences. So in a pandemic, that might be something that has an international consequence. And the World Health Organization often coordinates responses to these sorts of things that are a pandemic. However, if they're more epidemic, and then that's sort of suggesting a more local kind of level, then they may be a, a slightly different focus. There are also maybe different organizations that are involved depending on whether, on whether the uh, particular study that we're looking at has international implications or just local implications. So specifically, what are some of the benefits of epidemiological studies? Well, you're trying to gain a detailed understanding of the mechanisms that cause disease. And this can include uh, important risk factors, as we've looked at before, for different types of cancers, or they may also include specific pathogens for infectious disease, something that maybe um, is working through the Koch's postulates um, approach to linking the cause of an infectious disease with the pathogen. It may be that we're trying to improve the ability of scientists, health specialists and governments to coordinate appropriate responses to diseases. And we'll actually be looking at that in an upcoming video. But we've certainly got a number of public health campaigns and in the current COVID crisis that um, the, the world is facing, there have been here in uh, Australia, in New South Wales, a number of different uh, public health campaigns, a lot of the most recent ones, of course, associated with increasing the number of people who are vaccinated. The other thing with epidemiological studies is they can um, generate funding. So they can actually be um, persuasive enough to look at where we should send our funding, which areas 
are showing the most promise in the management or prevention of disease, uh, which ones are getting the most airtime, uh, which ones maybe are going to provide the biggest bang for the buck. Uh, and so therefore there can be uh, an issue around how do we allocate uh, particularly government, but also private industry funds in order to um, generate the greatest benefit for society and also potentially the greatest profits. So when you're evaluating the benefits of any particular epidemiological study, you can kind of consider some of those benefits in uh, uh, under two pairs of uh, I guess competing, not necessarily competing, um, but alternate viewpoints. Are the benefits of the study going to be short-term benefits or long-term benefits? Are they going to change the situation in the short term or the long term? Lockdowns that we've had associated with COVID-19 were designed to be short-term uh, benefits. So um, a, a short-term amount of pain for a short-term gain, that, that is being able to reduce this number, um, potentially that, that might have actually scaled into a long-term, but it hasn't been the case that that's happened. So often the, there's been a number of lockdowns to provide just a short-term benefit to get over a, an outbreak and to stabilise the population again. So as opposed to something like a lockdown strategy, what's, what's seen in terms of vaccination or immunisation is a longer-term strategy, a strategy that allows us to live with a disease rather than trying to eradicate the disease. And so that means that hopefully there will be a situation where the disease may still be present um, at some level in the population, but that life goes back to a level of normal. And so this is one of the things that we want to look at. Are there short-term benefits associated with stopping smoking, reducing alcohol uh, intake, better diet, uh, lack of exposure to uh, ultraviolet radiation, those sorts of things? Are those benefits short-term benefits or are they long-term benefits? Are they going to do something for us in the short term? And by us, I mean us as individuals or us as a wider society. Or are they going to have some long-term benefits that we know down the track our health's going to be uh, better or not worse? The other thing that we can talk about is the difference between direct and indirect benefits. So a direct benefit is something you can measure um, almost in terms of cause and effect. So there's a direct benefit to me if I um, give up cigarette smoking. If, I'm, if I've been a smoker and that um, has obviously had some of an impact on some of the cells in my body, I stop doing that. There's a direct benefit to me. There's a cause and effect. You've stopped doing A, so B is the consequence of that. Now, sometimes there can be indirect benefits as well, such as the people that I live with who maybe are no longer having to uh, inhale passive smoke. So there's a benefit to them by me giving up a particular practice that is not a healthy practice. And that could include changes in my diet, um, choices about uh, my exercise routines, uh, my alcohol consumption, all sorts of things like that. Um, it may well be that the sort of person that I become when I drink a lot of alcohol um, has uh, an indirect impact on the people that I live with or the people that I know. And so therefore by cutting down something that uh, is, has not been good for my health, I may find that I have um, improved health, but there may also be indirect benefits to other people around who are not having to deal with that situation or that fallout. So when we're talking about benefits, we're not just looking for the direct benefit, the, the, the obvious one, if you like, but we're looking for some of the flow on benefits that may also occur as a result. Um, this also has benefits, particularly in the areas of vaccination. So we've talked about um, an individual being vaccinated. The purpose of vaccination is to help your body uh, build up a specific response to a specific um, invading pathogen. But there's an indirect benefit to other people, particularly if the number of people who are vaccinated against a particular disease is very high and you're not one of them, you gain an indirect benefit from the vaccination program simply by the fact that so many other people that surround you um, have this increased um, resistance to a particular uh, pathogen. Therefore, are less likely to um, get sick, less likely to have serious symptoms, and hopefully, that is going to reduce its um, transmission from um, one person to another. 
So when you're evaluating the benefits, they can't be done in isolation, or usually they won't be done in isolation. They'll be part of a general evaluation of epidemiological studies. And these are just a few other criteria that you might just like to look at as you're going through your evaluations. Thanks for watching.